In 2016, gallerist Nicholas Treadwell, whose gallery was then in Vienna, asked me to contribute something to an exhibition called Earthly Delights. It was a themed exhibition of works inspired by Hieronymus Bosch, and I contributed a painting entitled The Commission of Lunacy. The idea had come to me after I unearthed some family history that involved two 19th century relatives, sister and brother, who were officially recorded as being of unsound mind or insane. Their names were Anne Serkham and Edward Serkham. In this and a later painting of the same title, I decided to depict an imagined and masked Anne Serkham, with figments of her unsound mind made manifest in the forms of creatures inspired by Bosch. There is a man's head wearing a nun's habit with an apple, a bejeweled harpy, a fish eating another fish, and a tiny worm emerging from the pear in Anne's hands. The front page of the commission document, the original of which is in the National Archives at Kew in Surrey, can be seen framed behind the figure of Anne. She appeared before an inquisition of the Commission of Lunacy in 1849 to determine whether or not she was of unsound mind. Anne was my four times great aunt, and her great niece was my maternal grandmother's mother, Mary Emma Serkham, who was born in 1859 and remained in living memory during my own lifetime. Mary Emma's likeness appears in the background of my second version of the Commission of Lunacy, and the original document's front page is this time suspended from a coat hanger on a cupboard door. Again we see invented fantastic creatures. There is a one-footed, decoratively collared bird, a blue snake within a cracked seashell. There are also tarot cards which depict the fool, the devil and the hanged man. Anne's costume in both paintings is extravagant, befitting her wayward turn of mind, and masked because I was uncertain of her physical appearance although there are two extant photographs which could be of her. Anne Serkham was born in 1799 in Exeter in Devon and was the fifth of eight children born to Elizabeth Otto Bayer and Thomas Fillmore Serkham. In 1826, her uncle, Bayer Otto Bayer, made the first version of his very long will. The will comprises ten closely written pages with several codicils, the last of which was added in 1838. Anne is named in the will, with her surviving siblings, as a beneficiary in the event of her mother Elizabeth predeceasing her brother Bayer, which she didn't. As the only son of seven children, Bayer had inherited virtually the whole of his father, John Otto Bayer's estate, in 1790, a substantial part of which was a sugar plantation in Antigua. His six sisters, including Anne's mother Elizabeth, had each received a legacy of a thousand pounds from their father. Bayer had two stepchildren, to whom he bequeathed the greater portion of his wealth, but nevertheless his surviving sisters, and eventually their children, received incomes derived from trust funds and investments. Bayer's London residence was number two Bentinck Street in Marlebone, and the house still stands today, near Manchester Square, which is just north of Oxford Street. Coincidentally, a bit further north of Bentinck Street was Marlebone Workhouse and Infirmary, and a 19th century map of the district clearly reflects the era's attitude to mental health problems in the names of certain areas of the institution, such as Idiot's Garden, Idiot's Yard, Insane Yard and Insane Halls. This is an extract from Bayer's will, relevant to his sister Elizabeth's inheritance. And as to the other said subdivided fifth parts, 
This refers to the residue of the estate after bequests to Bayer's stepchildren, divided equally between his sisters. I give the same for the sole use and benefit of Elizabeth, the wife of Thomas Sercombe, separate and apart from her said present and any future husband. And after the decease of the said Elizabeth Sercombe, then as to the principle of the said subdivided fifth part, and so much of the dividends and interest thereof as may accrue but during her life, I give the same unto John Sercombe, Edward Sercombe, Isaac Sercombe, Bayer Otto Sercombe, and Anne Sercombe, the children of my sister Elizabeth Sercombe, to be equally divided between them. Anne had to wait for her legacy until after her mother's death on the 1st of January, 1848. When Elizabeth made her own will in 1846, she left her entire estate in trust to her daughter Anne. This is the last will and testament of me, Elizabeth Sercombe, wife of Thomas F. Sercombe, now residing as separate from my husband at Heavy Tree near the city of Exeter. So far as regards the property bequeathed to me for my separate use by the will of my late brother, Bayer Otto Bayer, deceased, and which consists of a life interest in one third of a moiety of the residuary personal estate in England and of the product of the real and personal estate in Antigua of my said late brother, all is bequeathed upon trust for and for the sole use and benefit of my daughter Anne Sercum having regard for her unfortunate condition. By 1836, it had already been officially noted in relation to her brother Edward that Anne was mentally unbalanced and the circumstances of Edward's final illness and early death would no doubt have contributed to her mental state. Until 1836, Edward Sercum apparently led a quiet and conventional life. He had married Caroline Gifford in 1831. Caroline was descended from a well-to-do family, and in 1833, at the baptism of their daughter Emma, Edward is described as a gentleman of Waterloo Street in Clerkenwell. And then later, at the baptism of their son Edmund Bayer in 1835, as a clerk of St George's Terrace in Camberwell. Suddenly we find that his respectable life had descended into chaos when, on the 24th of September, 1836, he was admitted to Bethlehem Hospital Lunatic Asylum, also known as Bedlam, in Lambeth by his brother Bayer Sercombe. The hospital's report of Edward's admittance says that he was a married man of 40 with three children and that he was never insane before. Over the previous three or four months, he had begun to fail in mind due to some quarrel with his employer. Remarkable symptoms were that he was flighty and full of talk, but not violent, and that his condition might be hereditary due to his sister Anne being insane. On examination, Edward was found to be in a state of great mental excitement, restless and loquacious, and had committed himself in various unreasonable acts, making purchases altogether inappropriate and forming plans entirely unfit for his situation. On the 13th of January, 1837, Edward was discharged from Bedlam, sick and weak, and died the same night. The report says, after chronic inflammation of the membranes of the brain, producing effusion. Rather than suffering a sudden and out-of-character attack of supposed hereditary insanity, it is more probable that Edward had contracted an illness, possibly bacterial, that had unbalanced his mind. We shall never know. It seems unlikely that he was actually insane, but the report and diagnosis at Bedlam is the only one there is, unfortunately compounded by the fact of his sister's mental state. Edward was buried on the 20th of January, 1837, at Pentonville in London. His wife Caroline remarried and continued to live in London. In the census of 1841, 
When Anne was visiting her mother in Devon with two of her brothers, Isaac Henry Serkin and Bea Otto Serkin, she is described as being of independent means, as was her mother, here named Eliza. Anne's appearance before the Commission of Lunacy in June 1849 was only a little more than a year after her mother's will had been proved and Anne received her legacy. She was living at her brother Isaac's house at 16 Carter Street in Walworth in South London and had probably resided in London for some time. A newspaper report of the Inquisition appeared in Woolmer's Exeter and Plymouth Gazette on the 30th of June, 1849. On Monday, at the Horns Tavern, Kennington, an inquiry took place before Mr. Commissioner Winslow into the state of mind of Anne Serkham, a maiden lady aged 50, late of this city. The commission was issued at the instance of the lady's brothers, Messrs. I and W. Serkham. It was proved that she had delusions, which caused her to believe that her deceased parents were still living, that she had 16 servants, that she was constantly engaged in hunting and shooting, that the sparrows in her garden were woodcocks, and that she ate nothing but game. Many other eccentricities were stated in evidence, which the examination of the lady by the commissioner confirmed. And the jury found that she had been of unsound mind since the 12th of September last. The original document of the Inquisition is held at the National Archives at Kew, and I visited the archives to see it myself and take photographs. It doesn't contain the more sensational detail of the newspaper article, which was no doubt taken down from the hearing itself at Kennington, but instead follows a more sober format. The first part of the document, dated the 12th of June, 1849, begins with an appeal to the jurors of the inquiry to Know ye that we have assigned ye, or one of ye, to inquire by the oath of good and lawful men of our county of Surrey, as well within liberties as without, by whom the truth of the matter may be better known, whether Anne Serkham, spinster, now residing at number 16 Carter Street, is a lunatic or enjoys lucid intervals, so that she is not sufficient for the government of herself, her manners, messwages, lands, tenements, goods and chattels, and if so, from what time after, what manner and how. The conclusion of the inquiry itself, which took place at the Horns Tavern in Kennington on the 25th of June, 1849, before Edward Winslow, master in lunacy, was that, the said Uncircum hath been in the same state of unsoundness of mind from the 12th day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1848. But how or by what means she the said Uncircum so became of unsound mind, the jurors aforesaid know not, unless by the visitation of God. Many of the Commission's inquisitions were attempts to establish whether or not a person was of sound mind for the purposes of administering or disposing of their property and income, an issue of vital importance to the next of kin. The point of getting a person declared of unsound mind by a Chancery Inquisition was to take away his or her power of independent legal action concerning property and money. It had nothing to do with committal to an asylum. And indeed, Anne Serkham continued to live with her brother Isaac and his family. We see here the front page of a Chancery Bill of Complaint, dated 1853, in which Anne and Isaac are listed as complainants in a dispute about their uncle Bayer Otto Bayer's will. Anne is recorded on the first page as a person of unsound mind, and Isaac as Committee of the Person and Estate of the said Anne Serkham. The document later states that by an inquisition taken on the 25th day of June, 1849, under and by virtue of a commission for that purpose issued, the said Anne Serkham was found to be a person of unsound mind, and by order of the Lord Chancellor bearing the date, the 14th day of November, 1849, 
the said Isaac Henry Sercum was appointed to be the committee of the person and estate of the said Anne Sercum. Two years earlier, in the census of 1851, we find that Anne continued to live with Isaac, his wife, children and daughter-in-law at one Addington Place in Camberwell. They also had a general servant called Sophie Briscoe. Ten years later, the 1861 census shows us that Anne is still living at Addington Place with her brother and his family, which includes his four-year-old grandson, Henry, who is the son of his now widowed adult son, Edward. By this time, they had a different general servant named Mary Ann Mobbs. Anne died that same year, 1861, on the 16th of September at Addington Place. The death certificate records the cause of death as being general decay two months, diarrhoea one month. The house servant, Mary Ann Mobbs, was informant and present at the death. Anne was 62. At her death, Anne's estate amounted to less than £300. Not a bad sum of money to possess in 1861, but nevertheless her original inheritance seems greatly diminished. The public register of administrations for that year records on the 5th of December that letters of administration of the personal estate and effects of Anne Sercombe, late of 1 Addington Place, Camberwell, in the county of Surrey, were granted at the principal registry to Isaac Henry Sercombe, gentleman, the brother, and one of the next of kin of the said deceased, he having been first sworn. Anne is buried at West Norwood Cemetery in South London. Thank you.